Helen and Christine were both 17 years old. They'd just started working. They were friends. They'd gone out with some other friends, you know, that Saturday night. Helen was dressed in all her finery. She had bought a brand new, very expensive Burberry coat, the very latest in, in fashion, and um, they were dressed up, and they both looked like a million dollars. They were last seen leaving the World's End pub at around about 11 o'clock with two men. Neither of the girls made it home that night. The following morning, they were reported missing by their families. Soon after, local passers-by discovered the bodies of Helen and Christine in East Lothian. The shocking discoveries were made six miles apart. Their deaths would soon hit the headlines and become known as the World's End Murders, named after the pub in which they'd last been seen. It really was a death of, of innocence, and it's, it's, it was a sort of a milestone because if you're from Edinburgh and if you're a certain age, you will remember exactly where you were. Gradually, we pieced together a number of people who had been in the pub, and we started to do a sort of triangulation. And that confirmed our first beliefs that these two young men who had been in the company of Helen and Christine had questions to answer. Back then, they didn't have the technology. DNA wasn't a thing. The initial investigation, they just basically flooded Edinburgh with police. It was a huge responsibility that hung over the whole force, which, of course, was why it was so important that it was, it was solved. Despite their efforts, police struggled to trace the two suspects, but they never gave up. A breakthrough came in 2004, 27 years later, with advances in DNA analysis. Helen's coat was crucial. They knew there was physical evidence on the jacket. They just didn't have a means of extracting it and detecting who it belonged to. We managed to get a private company. They managed to pick apart that sample of DNA on Helen's coat. They discovered not one male sample, but two. We still couldn't identify the first sample, but when we tried the second sample against the database, it came up straight away, Angus Sinclair. Angus Robertson Sinclair. Angus Sinclair was already serving a life sentence for murder. With Sinclair identified, police now focused on finding a match for the second suspect's DNA. We concluded that the person who had been with Angus Sinclair when they murdered Helen and Christine was a man called Gordon Hamilton, who was Angus Sinclair's wife's brother. The problem was that Gordon Hamilton was dead. After 30 years, Angus Sinclair would finally face trial. On the 27th of August, 2007, he appeared at the High Court in Edinburgh. When Angus Sinclair was charged, there was this extraordinary feeling that, you know, this decades-long mystery was finally on the verge of being solved. While the press was optimistic, with no other physical evidence or eyewitness testimony to rely on, the prosecution's case focused on the DNA evidence. Now, if you can imagine any criminal case as being like a, being like a tent where you've got a, a strong pole, a centre pole, which is the main evidence, but that pole has got to be supported by guy ropes round it to keep it up, to give it that strength. In 2007, it went forward just on that single strand of evidence. And of course, the obvious weakness that we could see miles away was it was vulnerable to the defense of consensual sex.
Sinclair pled not guilty and lodged two special defences, one of consent and one of incrimination. He claimed to have left Helen and Christine alive and well, placing the blame on the now deceased Gordon Hamilton. After eight days of evidence, the defence submitted a no case to answer motion. In Scotland, once the Crown, the prosecution, has presented its case, the defence have an opportunity to send the jury out and to ask the judge to effectively dismiss the case on the basis there's not enough evidence to convict. Um, in this case, surprisingly, the judge agreed. And what's even more important, there was no way of appealing that. So that was the end of the matter. Angus Sinclair was acquitted. Shoulders were going down, you could feel the, the tension the, dis the despair that after all th those months and months and months of painstaking police work and forensic work, that it was all going to be for nothing. Now, almost three decades later, the case against the man accused of murdering them has sensationally collapsed, leaving their families devastated, the police furious and the Crown Office in crisis. Senior detectives believe vital evidence wasn't presented to the court. What's going to explain how I feel? 30 years of trying to get a conclusion. I promised him only twice that I would stick by this and get justice, which honestly I don't think I've had today. After the acquittal, the media revealed more about Angus Sinclair's criminal past, a violent history stretching back to 1961. He previously served six years for the murder of a young girl and in 2001 was convicted of the 1978 murder of teenager Mary Gallagher, for which he was serving a life sentence. This was a crime that bore striking similarities to the World's End murders. As it stood, the Crown had nothing they could do about this. It's covered by double jeopardy, that principle that you can't be tried twice for the same crime, whether you're convicted or acquitted of it. And therefore, there was really no route back into court in respect of Angus Sinclair. Fortunately, we were not the only people that were devastated because the media, the body politic, and senior law officers realized that this wasn't right. All credit to the then Solicitor General, later Lord Advocate Frank Mulholland, and Kenny McCaskill, the Justice Secretary at that time, they sensed that it wasn't right and that something had to be done. There was a recognition that something had gone aglay. This wasn't a matter that had gone to the jury who had decided that there something was wrong. It was a procedural collapse and therefore, without casting blame on anyone, it was what are we going to do to sort it out? In 2009, following a lengthy review, the Scottish Law Commission released their findings, recommending a change to the double jeopardy law, but advised it should not be implemented retrospectively. All the people who've been acquitted in Scotland at the moment have the security that they can't be charged again. They have a right, enforceable in the courts, not to be tried again. With the help of cross-party support in the Scottish Parliament, the Justice Secretary overruled the recommendations, allowing the bill to be enforced retrospectively. Very rarely do you have legislation that is retrospective, that is, that looks back. But I think in double jeopardy, given the whole nature of it, that you're only looking at a very few cases, that you are looking at historical cases, then it was clearly something that should be retrospective. In 2011, four years after the acquittal of Angus Sinclair, the Double Jeopardy Act was finally passed. The new legislation meant that only the most serious crimes could be retried, and the criteria was far from straightforward. The legislation restated the basic principle. You can't be tried twice for the same crime. But what it did was it set out three exceptions to this. The first is tainted acquittals. So effectively, if you bribe a juror, threaten a judge and get acquitted, you shouldn't get the benefit of that. So you can reopen those cases. Secondly, where the person who's been acquitted subsequently admits they did it. In that case, where they've effectively been condemned out of their own mouth, we can reopen the case. But perhaps most importantly was the third, which is new evidence. This gave the detectives fresh hope 
but it wasn't going to be easy. It has to be a very, very serious case, and it has to be new and compelling evidence. The new and compelling bit is a very, very high test um, to pass. But fortunately, forensic science was moving on. The breakthrough came with a groundbreaking new technique called Crime Light. It discovered previously unseen DNA samples on the clothing used to tie Helen and Christine's hands and feet. They were able to untie a knot and discovered the DNA entwined in the knot. That then gave the prosecution their perfect in, in that they were able to say, these are the two men that tied the knot. This was not consensual sex. The knots had been tied so tightly by Sinclair and Hamilton at the time that that evidence had stayed protected for 37 years. So it was like looking back in history. A man has gone on trial for the murders of two teenagers 37 years ago. 69-year-old Angus Sinclair has pleaded not guilty to the crimes. There was always that fear that something else was going to go wrong again. In a surprise move, Angus Sinclair took the stand to give evidence. He'd never done that before in any of the times he'd been convicted. And so when he came into the box and gave evidence, he confirmed that he was a cold, heartless, um, sociopathic person. He always kept his eyes straight ahead, almost as if he was, you know, focusing on the judge. He never looked at the jury, N not once did he turn his head. The only time he made a, a sort of body movement um, was when the prosecution were leading on the not evidence and he sort of gave a little, you know, shudder. After a five-week trial, the jury retired to consider their verdict. You think, has it been enough? Is it going to be a not proven? It's your last chance. And by that time, Helen's father, who'd been an absolute rock in this whole thing, he was there, but a man in ill health in his 80s. Just remember the silence, the absolute silence of waiting to hear what the jury was going to say when they came back. He is a serial sex offender and a convicted killer, who after nearly 40 years has now been found guilty of one of Scotland's most notorious double murders. On both charges one and two in Cumulo, I sentence you to life imprisonment to run from today, and I fix the punishment part at 37 years. Finally, the families of Helen Scott and Christine Eady had justice. We have waited 37 years for justice. Today, that wait has ended. Decades after their deaths, Helen and Christine's legacy is to have changed Scotland's justice system for the better. Politicians came together for Helen and Christine, and the introduction of the Double Jeopardy Amendment will prevent other families suffering the way we have. Helen's mum had died very young. She, she never really recovered from Helen's death. She died very young and, and Moraine had promised her on her deathbed that he would, he would stick it out and he would see um, Helen's, um, Helen's killer caught. And he did, and he did. First, let's give you the main news this morning. The UK's Supreme Court is due to rule on a case which could fundamentally change the way Scottish police question suspects. On a cold autumn morning, the UK Supreme Court in London met to deliver a judgment which would have a huge effect on Scotland's legal system. Can police interview suspects without a lawyer present as they've done for 30 years? The ruling would spread panic across Scotland's justice system and it was all sparked off by an altercation that took place in Glasgow's East End. The impact of this case on Scots law was huge. The law goes from small places to big places with very big consequences. 
On the 26th of May 2009, 18-year-old Peter Cadder went on trial at Glasgow Sheriff Court on three separate charges, two assaults and a breach of the peace. It was a serious charge, but very, very common in Glasgow in particular. So, a Sheriff Court case, not the sort of case that probably would ever have made headline news. Recently qualified defence lawyer Michelle Skelly represented Cadder in court. My firm were instructed in the case. I do remember meeting him, I think, the first day of his trial. It was a fairly routine case. The court heard that on the 13th of May 2007, Peter Cadder was detained by the police following an assault on two men by a gang of youths. He was taken to the police station and thereafter he was interviewed by the police. But he had no solicitor with him during his questioning and made several comments in that police interview that was then used as evidence. Evidence obtained during the police interview alongside witness testimony was key to the prosecution's case. There was the two witnesses, the two males, um, alleged to have been attacked, and the interview evidence. He was convicted um, by majority at tri after trial and sentenced accordingly. Immediately after the trial ended, Michelle and her colleagues decided to appeal against Cadder's conviction. The basis of the appeal would rest on the events following the alleged assault when the police had detained Peter Cadder and conducted an interview. He had not been offered access to a solicitor during this time. In Scotland, it was called detention. You know, usually from crime shows, you think you're being arrested. No, no, no. Before Cadder, you were detained. And while you were detained, you had no right of access to a lawyer or whatever. You couldn't even get them on the phone to get the legal advice that you should keep your mouth shut. You didn't have them at your elbow when you were being interviewed by police officers. You were entirely alone. An accused person was detained at the stage they were brought in for questioning by police and not arrested until after they were formally charged with an offence. Police will generally say, I'm going to caution you, so I'm going to ask you questions about an allegation of X. You're not obliged to answer any of those questions. But anything you do say may be used in evidence. The process against an accused person starts as soon as you're detained by the police as a suspect. Um, that's as an important part of the process as the rest of it, probably the most important part. Imagine it's you and imagine you're innocent and you find yourself for the first time in your puff, arrested or detained, taken into custody, confronted with two police officers. They've told you you have a right to silence, but does that go in? Do you really remember that? Is that what's on your mind as you're stressing about this encounter? For the last 30 years, police in Scotland had been allowed to detain a person for up to six hours without access to a solicitor. And in this respect, at this time across Europe, Scotland was in a very unusual situation. In England, this has been in place for years, but in Scotland, no one really had identified it as a big problem, but a big problem it would prove to be. The Scottish legal system has to take into account principles set out in the European Convention on Human Rights. A Turkish appeal case heard at the Court of Human Rights raised some questions for lawyers in Scotland. There was a case in 2008, the Saldus v Turkey, where again, I think it was a 17-year-old boy who had been questioned by the police without having access to a solicitor. His interview assisted in his conviction um, and he appealed against that. It was at that point the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights um, held that that was incompatible with his right to a fair trial and that the interview should have been inadmissible um, on that basis. I think that certainly highlighted that, oh, hold on a minute, we, we could have an issue here. While the Scottish Parliament is obliged to implement the principles laid out by the European Convention on Human Rights, it decided, despite the Saldu's ruling, not to make any changes to Scots law. It was argued that there were already enough safeguards in place to ensure the ability to give an accused a fair trial. So in 2009, the Scottish courts refused to hear Peter Cadder's appeal. And at that stage, my firm saw leave, special leave to appeal to the Supreme Court. Somebody had to take that extra step to go beyond um, our own appeal court. So Cadder's lawyers 
effectively decide to run a legal argument based on the European Convention on Human Rights. If that is a breach of human rights in Turkey, it's certainly a breach of human rights in Scotland as well. The UK Supreme Court granted Peter Cadder's appeal on human rights grounds on the basis that he had been questioned by police without access to a solicitor. In 2010, the appeal at the UK Supreme Court began amongst a growing concern about the potential fallout if the appeal was successful. In a ruling which could have profound consequences in Scotland, it may lead to the collapse of some current criminal cases, it'll drive up the cost of legal aid and policing. There could be far-reaching implications for our criminal justice system, far-reaching implications for the safety of communities, peace of minds of our victims. On the 24th of October, a bench of seven judges at the UK Supreme Court began hearing Peter Cadder's appeal. After two days of legal argument and submissions from all parties, the judges gave their ruling. Now, police in Scotland are to be banned from questioning suspects without a lawyer being present. The ruling has come from the UK Supreme Court. If Scotland were not to follow the example of others, in reforming its procedures in the light of Saldus, it would be almost alone among all the member states in not doing so. That, of course, threw into jeopardy all sorts of trials that was the evidence going to be usable that had been obtained by the police. What, did this, what were the consequences for other cases? The Supreme Court is well aware that the, this decision will affect very many cases in Scotland which have not yet gone to trial, where a trial is still in progress, or convictions are currently still under appeal. But there is no room in, for a decision that favours the status quo simply on grounds of expediency. 76,000 criminal cases could be affected by a ruling that Scottish police officers can no longer question suspects without a lawyer being present. However difficult it was, and however many challenges arose as a consequence, Scotland was out of step with this fundamental rights issue. And people in a similar situation, who were convicted on the basis of things they said, similarly, could not be prosecuted in future in Scotland. Immediately after the Supreme Court made their ruling, the Scottish Parliament got to work. People, when the Supreme Court handed down its judgment, were being interviewed without a lawyer in police cells in Scotland. You know, that was happening at the time. So they had to fix the system and fix it right now. They have to sort out this problem laid down by the UK Supreme Court on a devolution ruling. They have to fix it or they create more problems for the Scottish judicial system. The day after the judgment, MSPs gathered for what would become the longest ever parliamentary sitting. During a five-hour period, they discussed and debated the ruling before emergency legislation was finally passed. All sides here have agreed to make that happen, but some are worried that Scotland's fiercely independent tradition of law is effectively being redrawn elsewhere. The Justice Secretary doesn't like the ruling, nor does he welcome the UK court intervening in Scots criminal law. But I don't think we should underestimate the significant change that will now be incumbent upon the law of Scotland, brought in by a United Kingdom court that's not supposed to be the final court of appeal for criminal matters in Scotland. It literally was all hands to the pumps. This was significant change. We were going to have to get emergency legislation through in a matter of weeks. I just had to get on with it, and that is what we did. You know, you know did I welcome it? I didn't really have time to consider it. The new legislation meant that anyone detained by police must be given the right to have a solicitor present. Because of these changes, the maximum period of detention was also increased from six hours to 12 hours, with the potential to increase it to 24 if police required more time. If you were detained by the police, they would tell you that you can speak to a solicitor either on the phone or in person. In my experience, these rights are generally reiterated to persons on a number of occasions during their time in custody. Um, they have to ensure that the accused understand these rights and know that they can speak to a solicitor at any stage, even during an interview. As time passed, the true impact of the CADR ruling became clear. Judges were told there might be as many as 76,000 cases 
that would be impacted upon by deciding this conviction was unfair. 76,000. Now, in the end, it turned out to be 867, I think, including five uh, serious sexual offence cases. 867 is a lot of cases to drop. That's the consequence of the Cader decision. A good thing for individuals who find themselves accused of crime with a right of access to a lawyer. But at the same time, there was a knock-on effect for, for a range of these cases. The Cader judgment meant that only live cases and those currently under appeal were affected. In the months following the ruling, key changes were made to law and practice. It was significant change in police procedure, significant change for defence agents, significant change for the judiciary. Uh, so it wasn't simply, you know, changing one small aspect. Uh, it, it was a, a, a significant change in the whole procedure and system. Following on from the UK Supreme Court judgment, Peter Cadder's case was referred back to Scottish courts. The Crown were allowed to have a retrial in that case, so they would prosecute him minus the interview evidence. Evidence was heard and ultimately the witness was vague about the identification of Kader and that was the end of the matter against him. Due to insufficient evidence, the retrial collapsed and Peter Kader was acquitted. And the significant thing was that because of this, this case from the East End of Glasgow and the ruling of the Supreme Court, that the law changed. Cader will certainly stand as a big case for really bringing Scotland into the modern world in terms of recognising the rights of accused people. I think that's difficult to overstate the significance of that.